2019, Dartmouth College halted work on its brand new $200 million engineering school building. The problem? Its foundation, a 70-foot deep hole, was dug 10 feet too far to the south. This posed a huge and expensive problem for the contractor and the university. The real estate industry has a saying. Location, location, location. Location, location, location. Well, you know the line. The old line in real estate is, uh, the only thing that matters is location, location, location. For them, this means that a building's value is highly dependent on where a building is located. And that while a building can be changed easily by an owner, the surrounding context is much more difficult to influence. But for architects and building contractors, location means something else too. Something that needs to be determined with absolute precision, or it can lead to costly mistakes and inefficiencies. Since determining building location is so important, how do we decide where a building should go in the first place? How does a contractor know where a building is supposed to be? And how do architects and clients decide where they want their building? There's an entire website, misplaced.design, that shows buildings plucked from their context in the densely populated New York City and shown in the barren landscapes and deserts. The surreal juxtaposition is jarring and it's unsettling, proving viscerally just how important locations are to the design and the perceptions of buildings. Deciding where buildings should go is a complicated task. All sorts of visible and invisible forces figure into the equation that determines where to begin construction. Climate, zoning, topography, foliage, views, underground services. In this video, we will break down how architects decide where a building should be located. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Architecture with Stuart. My first job with computer-aided drafting in college was working for a surveying company. I drafted surveys of individual plots of land to certify that the property's description and the structures on it were as advertised. Because prior to a bank issuing a mortgage, they need to be certain about where they're lending their money. And surveying was the method that they used to check and make sure that things are where they're supposed to be. Encroachments of buildings onto other people's property can lead to very costly legal battles. When saying location, 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 real estate agents aren't really talking about these aspects of buildings, where the repetition of the word is mostly for emphasis. But for me, in thinking about architectural design, each utterance of the word has a unique meaning. The first one talks about the legal factors that dictate a building's location. And this includes things like zoning and property ownership. The second utterance uh, is in location, location, it talks about infrastructural considerations like services or ground conditions. And finally, the third one talks about environmental considerations like topography, natural features, views, and things like that. Most of these forces are revealed during a phase of design called site analysis, where data around these are gathered by the architect along with the client and map out where the building should go. For instance, here is a famous site analysis by the firm OMA that shows the primary paths of student travel on the IIT campus. This drawing successfully convinced everyone that this should be the site for the new student center and that it's perfect at the crux of all this activity. So in the first utterance of location, we think about legal considerations. Naturally, you can only build on the property that you're legally allowed to build upon. One couple's nearly $1 million dream house is beautiful. It's on the ocean. It is nearly, well, it is complete. The problem is, it's completed on the wrong lot. This usually means that you own the property, but it might not. Either way, designating, describing, and representing the earth as different parcels is a complicated activity, as well as defining precise locations on its surface. We often need fixed references to position buildings relative to. In the United States, we have a grid that Thomas Jefferson imagined to cover the entire country in one mile squares oriented to the north and the south. This was part of the National Land Ordinance of 1785. Before this grid was adopted, colonies were surveyed using the British system of meets and bounds, where property boundaries were defined by local geography and topography. A typical description for a parcel of land might read, from the point on the north bank of Muddy Creek, one mile above the junction of Muddy and Hubbard Creeks, north for 400 yards, then northwest to the large standing rock, west of the large oak tree, south to Muddy Creek, then down to the center of the creek to the starting point. This of course can be confusing and when natural features change, the description of the property is no longer valid. 
The gridded division of the land established by Jefferson in order to solve this problem is broken down into successively finer increments, each with its own name, until we get down to two and a half acre parcels. Each square has its own automatic description that describes where it is relative to section markers that are placed on the ground. So those descriptions might read, a tract of land located in the northeast quarter of the southwest quarter of section 23, township 12, range 2 east. Within your legally defined parcel, there are other legal considerations like easements and setbacks. Easements are areas of the property that you can't build on for various reasons. These areas are usually described in the property description itself. Reasons for an easement might include areas with above or below ground services that need to be accessed, or agreements with other parties that may need to use the property for some reason. Zoning laws might also dictate where you can build in order to maintain neighborhood continuity with things like setbacks, which are a common distance from a roadway that one must honor, or in a city to give other buildings enough room for access to light and air. Also, zoning laws might establish distances for staying away from local protected environments like wetlands or sand dunes. These laws also dictate where you can build structures for certain activity, so they regulate building houses among other houses or factories among other factories. Of course, cities like Houston famously have no zoning laws which tell folks where to build certain kinds of structures. This produces jarring juxtapositions of buildings of very different types. Location, location. The second one talks about infrastructure. And what I mean by infrastructure are the supporting aspects of the environment that help us to solve logistical issues for buildings in ways that might make certain places better than others. These include connections to pedestrian ways or roads or public transit. For some buildings, you might want easy pedestrian access, while in others, you might want it more secluded. So the question of how physically and visually accessible you want the structure can determine where it should go. Another might be underground conditions like services, such as sewer, water, electrical, and gas line connections. These can be costly if a building is located far away from where those connect to the site. So it's often in your best interest to locate buildings near these service connections. And finally, soil conditions across the site can make a huge impact on where it makes sense to build a building. Different kinds of soils have different capacities for holding up a structure which can greatly affect how tall you can build or what kind of foundation that you'll need. Rock is great structurally, while sand is shifty and it's difficult to secure a building within. Soil porosity can also determine how well it drains water, making certain sites more suitable for construction than others due to flooding or other factors. Also, underground water heights and aquifers can make certain sites undesirable for likely underground water damage. Soil testing can be done across the site to determine the local changes, and they may take the form of test pits or borings. Soil load tests can help determine how much structural capacity the soil exhibits. The third location is environmental. And one of the most important environmental factors is the sun, and how it interacts with aspects of the site can profoundly influence where buildings are placed. The sun can help warm a building when the air is colder, by shining into the interior or by warming exterior materials. Or it can provide important diffuse light during the day. Where I am, the sun comes predominantly from the south, so buildings are positioned to strategically take advantage of its benefits. Also because of this, south slopes of hills tend to be warmer than northern slopes of hills. So in colder climates, this might be an advantage. And in warmer climates, a northern side of a hill might be more desirable. Hills and topography also block or channel water, wind, and noise. In a warm climate, breezes help to keep fresh air flowing through buildings. So positioning a structure to take advantage of these is important. But in colder climates, it's best to position a building in a location that is more protected. Protection can also come from trees, with different types of trees behaving very differently. Deciduous trees drop their leaves in the fall, opening channels for light and air during the winter months. So in temperate climates, these trees can keep a building shaded and cool during the summer while allowing more sunlight to warm the structure in the winter. So locations of existing trees can be an important determinant of a building's location. Finally, views both in and out of a building can sometimes be a contributing or even a most important factor for a building's location. This is especially true for cities or locations with significant natural features like mountains or bodies of water. One of my favorite unique building locations is the site for the Casa Melaparte. It sits precariously atop a rock outcropping on the island of Lipari. It takes an hour and a half to walk to this house through narrow paths. When the owner was asked if he bought the house or designed it, he responded, I designed the scenery. 
There's obviously no formula for positioning a building in the perfect location. Every building is different, and every location has different factors. The process is a negotiation between all these factors to find the best possible location for the unique circumstances. Do you know of any buildings with strange locations? Let's discuss them in the discussion section below. Also, if you've enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribe. If you do, you'll be one of the first to see when the next video drops, which will be about an unbuilt house that was to be located on a super unique location in Houston, Texas. Until then, check out some of these other videos and consider becoming a channel member like these awesome folks by clicking on the join button below. See ya.